On the 15th of August 1950, three years after flying saucers became a common household term used to describe anomalous objects reportedly seen in skies around the world, radio station owner Nicholas Mariana became the first person to produce 16mm camera film of the saucers when he spotted a formation of objects above a local sports field in Mizola, Montana. I saw two silvery objects moving swiftly out of the northwest. The objects were very bright and about 10,000 feet in the air. They appeared to be of a bright, shiny metal, like polished silver. Both were the same size and were traveling at the same rate of speed, which was much slower than the jets which shot by shortly after I filmed the disc. Although analysts at wright Patterson Air Force Base said nothing decisive could be established from the footage, Robert M. L. Baker, Jr., a photo analyst with the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, said the objects, which were composed of bright circular points of light with rotating rims, could not have been aircraft, because the formation stopped at one point before setting off again. On the 2nd of July, 1952, at around 11 a.m., U.S. Navy Warrant Officer Delbert C. Newhouse filmed these objects with his 16mm camera above Tremonton, Utah. He described the UFOs as two inverted saucers on top of each other. Months later, a United States Air Force spokesman said, We don't know what they are, but they're not aeroplanes or balloons, and we don't think they're birds. The U.S. Navy then studied the film. After a frame-by-frame -frame analysis, they concluded, the objects are internally illuminated spheres and are not reflecting sunlight. At five miles distance, the analyst determined that the objects were probably travelling at speeds of 3,780 miles per hour. At a distance of 10 miles, the UFOs would have been travelling at 7,560 miles per hour. Later that same month, after UFOs had been spotted over Washington DC and detected on radar, the largest press conference held since World War II saw Air Force Major General John Samford deliver these telling remarks. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. We have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. Between the mid-1950s and into the late 1980s, UFO footage was not only extremely rare, but often highly contentious, such as the Cineclips, taken by alleged UFO contactee George Adamski in the 1950s, and this colour footage, taken by another alleged contactee, Swiss farmer Billy Meyer, in the mid-1970s. But there were exceptions, most noticeably on New Year's Eve 1978, when a television camera crew filmed this object while flying over the east coast of South Island, New Zealand. And, during a test flight of Concorde, this mysterious sphere-like object was just to be nothing more than stray light caught on the camera lens. By the turn of the 1990s, however, the newly invented camcorder was beginning to generate UFO footage on an unprecedented scale. No more so than in Mexico, which, from mid-July 1991, began experiencing one of the largest UFO waves in recorded history. And, in the midst of this wave, came a relatively new phenomena, the so-called fleets, where dozens, and often hundreds of mysterious sphere-like objects, were filmed right across Mexico. Inevitably, some of the Mexican footage was deemed dubious, such as this sequence, submitted by an anonymous individual, yet nonetheless aired at a time when new, an emerging computer software was now capable of generating hoax UFO footage. By the end of the millennium, and with camcorders now within the reach of most people's pockets, thousands of UFO clips had been generated around the world. But despite this, 
skeptics still maintain that none could be deemed proof positive of extraterrestrial visitations, and with reasonable cause. For more often than not, the vast majority of UFO footage had been taken at night, and, like many of the daytime sequences, showed anomalous objects at distance. But there remained a belief amongst UFO researchers and enthusiasts alike that someone would, eventually, be in the right place and at the right time to videotape a UFO at much closer proximity. That someone turned out to be this man, Anthony Woods, a quiet and unassuming individual who lives with his family on the outskirts of Portsmouth, home to the Royal Navy on the south coast of England. A few years ago, after noticing anomalous objects repeatedly crossing the sky from the rear garden of his home, Anthony decided to purchase a camcorder in order to film them. But there were no guarantees they would pay him a return visit. But return they did, on countless occasions. And each time, Anthony had his camcorder to hand to record the events, often in the company of others. With each passing month, the objects would take on different forms, linger for several minutes at a time, or appear en masse. And with each passing year, Anthony's library of UFO videotapes would grow. The seconds became minutes, the minutes became hours, the hours climbed into the dozens and then surpassed the 100 mark. Little did he know it at the time, but when Anthony Woods first set out to videotape the UFO activity above his home, he would eventually go on to record more UFO footage than any other individual on the planet. Moreover, the bulk of Anthony's footage was shot during the daytime and, as opposed to distant and blurry images, here were many clearly defined objects whose shape and passage through the skies would come to baffle even the experts. But why Anthony Woods? And why were UFOs making repeated visits to this particular region and in such voluminous numbers? These and a host of other questions were very much to the fore when researchers from the Leeds-based UFO magazine journeyed to Portsmouth to meet and interview Anthony Woods for the first time. Countless other visits to Portsmouth followed over the course of the next 12 months, and then, in the early summer of 2003, Anthony Woods began to talk openly about some very deeply felt and personal experiences in his life. Questions. Lots of questions. And then there was Anthony's extraordinary footage. Lots of it. Although the footage is relatively recent, Anthony's first encounter with a UFO came not during adulthood, but as a child. My first sighting um, to do the UFO phenomena um, started when I was a young boy, aged eight, um, back in 1972. Happened on a bright, clear morning, November morning, a um, few puffy clouds about. Me and some friends were playing out in the street um, when all of a sudden my attention was turned towards the sky. I looked up. Um, saw this round silver metallic object with portholes around the middle. I looked round to see where my friends had gone for a second, looked back again and the object had gone. I mean after the sight in 1972 uh, when I was age 8 I had a lot of reoccurring dreams about the phenomena, about UFOs, even though I didn't know what it meant, I didn't know what the what UFOs really were and that. Um, but I did have reoccurring dreams right through to adulthood. I mean, it, tu it touched me when I was really young, aged eight. And it seemed to, even though I had the reoccurring dreams, um, and inside I was, I was, you know, wanted to find the answers what it was all about. Through the teenage years, you know, it didn't really affect me deeply, even though it was in the back of my mind all the time. But it wasn't until I was in mid twenties. Um, when I met my future wife now, um, that the next experience really, really started for me again. The UFO question came back, came back to me again, and uh, it all started up again, you know. And that was in no 1990, one um, holiday down in the New Forest, and um, a camping, camping one night, and um, outside our tent, we'd been out in the evening. We had a meal come back to the tent, 
lovely beautiful night sky see the stars um, we sat down outside the tent just admiring the, the beautiful sky and suddenly I could see right up high two little dots dancing in the sky moving from one point to the other just like playing tag two little dots dancing dancing all over the place um, we just both watched these two dancing lights for over half an hour and I don't even, can't even remember how they went we were just watching them and then they were gone uh, it was quite amazing and that's how it all started up again um, then in about a week after that um, when we got back home uh, one evening um, probably about half past five, six o'clock uh, this, is, this is in August. Um, I looked out over towards um, Portsdown Hill and I saw a black object uh, above the bases in Portsdown Hill. Um, I couldn't figure out what it was. I knew it wasn't something mundane or ordinary, something weird. Um, the next night in the newspaper there was a, a local professor from a, a local college that also ob observed this sighting, this object. Um, and there was an article about it, and it was unusual, very unusual. More UFO sightings would follow for Anthony, and the journey, it seemed, had begun in earnest. I think my next experience um, to do with UFOs happened in 1996. Um, it was in May 1996, uh, probably about half past ten, quarter to eleven, at my parents' home, uh, opened the back door to the garden to let the dog out. Um, noticed the dog hesitated going out, cowered back from the door. So I quickly looked out to see why she wouldn't go out. And directly to the left of me, over the rooftops, an object came gliding over. Massive, easily 30, 40 feet. Silent, 50 feet above the, the rooftop. I was you know, shocked, couldn't believe what it was. I just watched it as it glided gracefully and quietly over the rooftops heading up towards Portsdown Hill. As it got into the distance, it became just a small ball of light. And it was really shocking, it really shook me up seeing this. Um, and the next night, I mean, after that, I mean, it just, I talked to my family about it, I told my wife, I said it was just amazing. And the next night, I opened the door up, um, probably about nine o'clock again, I opened the door up, and there was a bright light, really high up in the sky, but it was massive, the light was massive, dead still. I watched it for about 20 seconds, and it was just dead still. Then all of a sudden, this light started to move very slowly, I just watched it and I carried in the door a bit because it's quite a big light and um, eventually it just seemed to move off. I just watched it go into the distance. The sheer volume and regular appearance of anomalous objects above Anthony's home compelled him to act. It wasn't long before Anthony would press the record button for the first time and in the days, weeks and months that followed he would go on to record what is arguably the greatest daylight footage of UFOs that the world has ever seen.
hear this. How do you have this just sitting out there? That's just sitting there. Yeah, that's just sitting there. Amidst this extraordinary activity, oh, one day in particular stood out. It was the day when Anthony came to film a fleet of UFOs above his home. Although these hundreds of mysterious sphere-like objects are strikingly similar to those filmed in daylight skies over Mexico, there is one important That's distinction to be made. This particular yeah. fleet meandered through the daytime skies above Portsmouth, Bye. uninterrupted, for almost six hours. Bye. For Anthony and others who watched this spectacle, it was an incredible sight. This was another fleet uh, sighting. Uh, this was absolutely amazing. It, it started um, for me once again, just walking out in the garden and seeing this fleet of objects in the sky. I called to my wife again and, and she watched with me. And um, it, it was really spectacular and amazing. Um, these objects were in clear formations. Uh, at one point they seemed to be a cross formation. You can see the movement between the objects are interacting with each other and um, you know, whatever these objects are, they're not balloons, they're not mundane. There's clear intelligent movement. Um, it's just amazing. When comparing the sphere-like objects with the release of conventional balloons, the difference is stark. But what of other, conventional airborne objects? During one afternoon spent in the rear garden of Anthony's home, our camera crew filmed a variety of aircraft at different altitudes. Birds came and went, and then, out of the blue, appeared a solitary sphere, which was filmed independently on three different cameras. Conventional and unconventional aircraft are familiar to most, as indeed are their military variants. But compared to some of the anomalous objects later filmed in close-up by Anthony Woods, they bear little relationship whatsoever. One man intrigued by Anthony's footage of the fleet is Gary Heseltine a serving detective constable with British Transport Police, 
and the founder of police reporting UFO sightings. Prufos, as it is commonly known, receives UFO reports from serving, as well as retired, British police officers. But it was the movement of these sphere-like objects that Gary found so fascinating. Um, the material supplied to me consisted of over four hours worth of clip material, which is a, a, a huge number of uh, UFO uh, sequences to review. Uh, many were out of sequence in terms of date and whatever. And what I set about doing was cataloguing in a chronological order, much in the same way that I would do it for a video exhibit uh, for court, uh, is, is coming up with basically a review package that starts chronologically with the first event and ends with the last event. And what I found was that over a uh, three and a half year period, uh, there were in excess of over 50 days, separate days, when uh, UFO or anomalous footage was recorded. Now that in itself is uh, an exceptional amount of footage and what is even more extraordinary is that 90% of the material is daylight footage set against a clear blue sky and a gentle cloud. So almost perfect conditions. One of the other things that I found was that not, a lot, not only was there 50 separate days, in excess of 50 separate days, on many of the days in particular there were multiple sequences. Uh, what I mean by that is that there may well be eight different segments, up to eight or nine different segments on one particular day. And again when it comes to cataloguing, what I can say is of the four hours of clip material that I've reviewed, you're looking at over 200 separate sequences, which is an exceptional amount of material for effectively one man or one family to have captured on film. The term uh, fleet footage, which uh, uh, for those that may not be familiar, is, is basically groups of objects seen in the sky at the same time. Now fleet footage really sort of uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, in the history of the subject we can look at uh, Tremonton footage from the 1952 I believe and that showed multiple objects, white objects in the sky. Much in the same way as much of this footage uh, is very very similar. Similarly when you look at the Mexican uh, footage from the 80s and the 90s showing multiple objects in the sky often in daylight it's way on a comparison with those. And what particularly interested me from a lay point of view is that when you am examine the fleet footage in close detail, as I've been fortunate to do, you can see that the objects move in a variety of ways, are constantly changing positions, but more importantly, do not act anything like balloons because they go against the wind, they appear to accelerate uh, away from each other, there appears to be a degree of intelligence associated with these uh, objects. On one particular sequence of the fleet footage, uh, which was seen on one particular day, um, there are up to 20 objects seen on camera. In fact, there's so many objects that the cameraman, Mr. Woods, doesn't really know what to zoom in on and, and focus on. But when he does uh, pull away, it shows enough material that shows quite independent movement of each other. And there are several sequences that were attached to that, that having maybe seen the 15, 20 objects at the start, they then appear to go past and over his house in groups of twos and threes. And which again adds to this uh, uh, sequence where there may be up to eight or nine sequences on one particular day and that initial fleet footage is, is one of those days where there are multiple sequences backed against each other and they are particularly interesting because they form formations which give uh, uh, which fly over his roof and the roof is in shot and then they give lovely 3d perspective Gary is one of the few people to have met Anthony Woods during a visit to the offices of UFO magazine in Leeds as an experienced police officer Gary is a good judge of character, so what did he make of Anthony Woods? Having now spent uh, a good 12 months uh, uh, cataloguing and examining the Anthony Woods material, I'm entirely satisfied from my own professional experience that this is not a hoax in any way. Uh, I know for a fact that the masters have all been examined at great detail 
and that they are intact and there is no suspicion of, uh, of uh, misuse. Um, having examined all the footage uh, that he has produced, I believe that this is the most stunning material ever recorded on film and the beauty of it is it's re filmed in Britain and that it's uh, set against blue skies predominantly with cloud, with 3D perspective and we have truly uh, been uh, very lucky to capture this sort of footage. While the majority of Anthony's UFO footage was taken from the rear and front gardens of his home, there were occasions when he managed to record them elsewhere, more often than not, in close proximity to military installations. Sites like this, of the Royal Navy carrier Ark Royal, just back from serving in the war with Iraq, are not uncommon. Steeped in tradition, Portsmouth has for centuries been home to the Royal Navy. Hence it is no surprise for the surrounding area to be littered with all manner of training, supply and communication installations. Is there a connection? For example, is this object, filmed hovering for a considerable period of time above one such installation, some form of unconventional but nonetheless man-made remotely powered vehicle? Or is it a genuine UFO? Take a look at this sequence. At first sight, the object appears to be nothing more than debris caught up in a gust of wind. But watch, is this really debris or is it something else? Now compare it to this object, which Anthony Woods captured on film on a relatively mild, calm day. Are the two one and the same? And what are we to make of its extraordinary shape and aerobatics? When Tim Farrell came to examine this particular sequence, it certainly intrigued him. Now retired from the RAF and living in Cornwall, Tim is an expert witness often called upon to give evidence on video footage. He could not explain the object and wondered, what's keeping it up? But by far and away the most unusual looking UFO ever filmed by Anthony Woods is this. Filmed in the presence of his brother-in-law, Tony, this extraordinary object is like nothing ever seen, nor photographed or filmed in UFO history. Here now is the sequence in full for you to ponder.
We wanted to know what was going through the minds of both Anthony and his brother-in-law Tony as they observed this extraordinary object. This sighting on the 27th of the 3rd of this year was absolutely amazing. Um, both me and my brother-in-law witnessed it and it was something that we have never ever seen before. Um, it appeared to have structured lights on it. Um, just amazing sighting, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, because the first thing that struck me about it was the light sequence. Uh, they were changing, going on and off, and the object was moving very gracefully across the sky. I mean, we were just looking up, and it caught, caught our attention out of, out of the corner of our eye, and it was just there. And the, the lights themselves are really bright. I mean, I've got a good view in the binoculars, and they're very intense light. You said they're dome-shaped, didn't you? Yeah. yeah, the lights had a sort of a, a, a curved shape to them. They were definitely coming out of the surface, and the colour was so intense. The object was quite large, yeah. and it showed that, especially against the blue sky. And it was interesting that as the object was slowly moving, um, hovering on occasions, it kept flashing these lights at us. It was almost like it was doing it on purpose, mm. but um, mm. it was very, very odd. I think it's good that the, with the trees in reference, you can sort of get a taste of um, yeah, good the movement of the object. Yeah. It wasn't particularly very high to begin with. At the beginning, it was it was quite sort of low. It was, as it as it went on, it sort of increased in altitude, but it was in no hurry. Most unusual object I've ever seen. Yeah, spectacular. Mm. To help in our understanding of the makeup of this object we commissioned Andrew Fry to undertake a painstaking frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the footage. Andrew, whose background in computer animation has seen him work on hit movies such as Jurassic Park, used some of the most sophisticated computer software available to come up with this amazing 3D rendition. Here, he explains how he went about that process, and offers his thoughts as to what the object might be, and definitely is not. I received the video from you, and I'd already previously, I was really, really intrigued. You know, I thought it was an outstanding piece of filming, um, and I thought I could clean this up, and it would be good to see what it looked like. So the first thing I did was enlarge the image, which would produce that ship there. Uh, that's the cleanest I could get it from the video that I had, and, and that's been enlarged about 10 or 15 times. So you've still got a bit of blurring, but the actual image is quite reasonably clear. Now from that I produced an outline. Um, basically it's, it's an edge detection, it finds edges of the ship and the surrounding lights. So that produced that image. Now it's from that image where I've got the lines that I actually could produce a grid or at least a set of pixels to draw a diagram from. So which took me to To that, which is basically it's like a dot to dot. Um, I can, um, from that I can produce a three dimensional image, actually I need two of those, and even from the side, as, well I've got more from the side, but I need from, from the back or the front. I produced a three dimensional model um, in grid form that you can see there. Um, So as you can see, the, the outline and the shape of that is very close to what's been produced on the video. Um, this is just a, a filled in version, you can actually see the shape that we can actually rotate and see from various angles. Now it is possible to actually colour this in for the colours that we saw in the video. Now we know the spaceship is black. Now I won't colour in any of the lights. Now this is going to take a few seconds. Um, I won't colour in the lights so you can actually see the shape of it, but basically where the lights are I've put some phosphorescence and some colours for you to see what it's all about. I just thought it was the most aerodynamic craft ever. I mean, it, it, I would not think of this as being a flying ship craft or plane of any sort.
Yeah, one thing I did notice about it was that it had no specific line of symmetry. Normally, with anything that shape, you would have basically a vertical line of symmetry. Now, with this, it's at quite an acute angle, so it actually tr the line of symmetry travels from the end of this section roughly through the centre of the, the body, and it actually rotates at that angle on the video. No, it's something I can't duplicate with this at the moment. Yeah, people people would they would they would ask if it's on the end of a piece of string or, or wire. But no, the the angle of incidence that it actually rotates on, it would be impossible to have that at the end of a piece of string. Absolutely impossible. You would need a vertical line of symmetry for that. Now the image I really, really believe is real. Um, with all the line detection software I've used for it I've gone through all the three phases of colours, the red, blue and green, and there is no hint of any surrounding fuzziness, I suppose, where you would actually get a, a superimposed image over, but there is nothing like that. Everything is crisp and clean and a true image. Now, basically, the, the initial step I wanted was to find the shape of the craft. Uh, now I've done that, and that's the image I've actually produced. Uh, it looks like a number six, or if you want, an E upside down. Um, but I actually want to give it a touch of realism as well. Now, it, that shows a shape, but if you put the lights on, as you get in the video, everything will get blown. Uh, you will lose sight of the craft, and all you get is a big white or red haze. So uh, I've done two images, one with lights on and one with lights off. And Essentially, that is what was seen on the video. So, yeah, I think people should take a good look at this. And if there's someone who can do a better job than I can, fine, take a look. I don't think they'd find any problem with it either. After Andrew Fry's analysis, we next came to commission this man, Professor Roger Green, one of the country's leading home office experts in image analysis to run his rule of thumb over some of Anthony's film sequences. Filmed at Warwick University earlier this year, this is what Professor Roger Green had to tell us. Yes, I've been involved in uh, research and te the technology of video systems for over 25 years from when I was a research student. And uh, in, the more, in the last 20 years, been involved with legal matters in terms of being a wet, an expert witness in the area of video and audio systems, especially video and audio evidence. Um, I've latterly taken an interest in unidentified um, images, UFOs, ghosts, things of that nature in terms of applying legal imaging understanding techniques to the evidence presented as objectively as possible. There's uh, three sequences of rather strange flying objects, uh, in particular the first and the third objects both flew in an unconventional manner and also looked unconventional compared to standard flying equipment of our time, aircraft and uh, things of that nature. And uh, the way the objects moved and the fact they moved up and down as well as laterally suggests a kind of controlled movement rather than a random movement caused by just winds alone as might be the case with balloons or lightweight objects just blown about by the wind anyway. The film is a bit ambiguous, I agree, in respect of whether it's reflected or uh, light from a source on the object. There are certainly uh, reflections from parts of the object as the thing rotates and not always from the same direction, which tends to discount perhaps reflections overall because normally the reflections from a shiny object will be from the same direction as the object had a reflective surface then facing the source of light in comparison with which an object which appears to show reflected light but from different directions as it moves might therefore it might therefore be concluded that in fact there are sources of light on the object as well so there may be both reflected light uh, sort of phenomena and source light phenomena from the object so it is a tricky object to characterize in that respect from the images presented one cannot say how light is generated one can just say that light apparently is emitted. Uh, we can see by virtue of the camera having filmed it that light is emitted in the visible part of the spectrum 
but it's also possible that uh, other other wavelengths have been emitted as well which were not within the range of the camera this cannot of course be ascertained from the video evidence uh, in images uh, one and sequences I should say one and three the flight patterns were very strange uh, in standard aircraft or man-made flying objects the flight path tends to be linear or curved in a, a smooth manner these objects tended to tumble or move through the sky uh, in a, apparently sort of different paths uh, one of the objects for example the one rotating in an anti-clockwise direction as it appeared to be on the screen uh, actually seemed to fall for a while then stay stationary then rise suggesting quite a high degree of control of the movement and yet the movement was completely unusual in the fact the object was rotating uh, in the case of the third object there was a similar sort of interesting movement showing movement down along and up in the sky as can be judged by various other objects which came into the field of view as reference the, the movement uh, is, is rotational at a fairly constant speed it seems and in the same apparent direction to the, for the most part to the viewer in the case of the first object and that does not suggest something tethered that's rotating as it's being pulled down or in just one standard direction because the object both moves down and upwards in the field of view and it, it doesn't make sense that it's tethered and just being blown down wind and rotating like for example a kind of propeller structure of some kind uh, something of that nature it's, it's not a, an easy matter to fake things you need a lot of care to make a fake look convincing um, I didn't examine the images in very close detail in terms of uh, seeing signs of faking but a typical signs would be that the structure of the object is not the same as the structure of the background for example if you were superimposing one image on the other the lighting on the object wouldn't be compatible with the lighting in the rest of the scene if you were faking, faking something and if it was a matter of something like a, a saucer being thrown in front of the camera near to rather than a, fly, a UFO further away for example then there would be clear signs of reflections from nearby objects uh, on, on the object which clearly was not the case the object was clearly a long way away as could be seen when the camera zoomed in and out in in all three s image sequences one could see that the object is so whatever size it is a long way away from the camera and therefore not within arm's length or anything like it for the purpose of faking and to fake something a long way away one would require spending a lot of money on somebody in an aircraft and going to some trouble to drop something of some sophistication to create these rather unusual movements so I think probability would rule out fakes in this case these in my view are are genuine unidentified flying objects the origination of which of course cannot be determined from the image information but certainly they are non-standard in in all respects thanks to Gary Hesseltine the same sequences seen by Professor Green and Andrew Fry found their way to another leading image analyst. Because he is employed in a civilian capacity by the police in Northern England, his identity cannot be revealed, but, working part-time on the footage, he made an amazing discovery, as Gary Heseltine now explains. A friend of mine who is a home office video analyst, I took uh, the footage to him and said, well, what do you think to this? And he was an ex-military man and uh, he did me some uh, uh, filter work and applied various uh, different uh, super uh, filters to it. And he produced a number of images uh, similar to the one that you'll see on screen. Now, the object that you'll see on screen that's set against a green background is a representation of the heat output and where the two lights, the two permanent lights are, they appear to be the coldest area of the object and the, the uh, hottest part is the red coloured areas which appear to show a, in his opinion, a flange type protrusion which appears to be, from the, his analysis, the hottest part. Now, the sequence that, you've, that you're watching as I speak is this footage and you can quite clearly see there is 3D perspective with the trees, the object is moving between the trees a lot of time has been spent on working whether the, on, on whether the image passed before the trees, behind the trees and things like that frame by frame analysis and basically from my video analyst point, friend point of view his opinion is that this is a real 3D object that was flying in the sky 
of some size that is of an appearance like he has never seen before. And he did spend time in the Air Force, was well uh, used to aircraft recognition, and this has totally stumped him. He's not aware of anything that fits this flight characteristic. Someone else we invited to comment on the footage was Nick Pope. I've worked for the Ministry of Defence for 18 years now and uh, between 1991 and 1994 my job at the department was to research and investigate the UFO phenomenon. It's always important with a UFO case to have uh, something more than just the testimony of the witness. So when I was doing the UFO job uh, on occasions where I received photographs and videos this was extremely important and that happened quite a bit. I, I mean I must have received several dozen uh, during my tour of duty. Now of course there were things that we could then do, uh, specialist uh, analysis and image enhancement, so it's an important part of my official UFO research. I can't talk uh, in specific terms about what I would then do with photographic and video evidence that I looked at during my tour of duty. Uh, clearly you would expect that the MOD uh, would have all sorts of uh, uh, specialist equipment and personnel who could help with uh, image analysis and enhancement. But while I can't go into the specifics, what I, what I can say is that uh, what you're doing with this sort of footage uh, and the specific images that you've got now is, is very much, I think, along the, lo the right lines. You're going to law society expert witnesses, uh, you're getting specialists in. Now, while I wouldn't necessarily have gone to the same people, as I say, we have our own, uh, you're certainly investigating this in the right way. Speaking in general terms, it's clear that you've got some very important and significant footage here. It's very impressive. Um, it's unusual to get such good imagery taken in the daylight. It's also unusual to have other objects in the frame uh, so that you've got a point of reference from which you can start to make some calculations about size of object and distance. From a defence and national security point of view, clearly uh, the Ministry of Defence and the Royal Air Force will take uh, you know, seriously any unauthorised penetration of the United Kingdom air defence region. Now whether this footage constitutes evidence of, of such an incursion or not, I, I don't know. That would not be for me to, to say. But uh, self-evidently, if structured craft are flying around with impunity in our airspace and we don't know uh, what they are, then from a personal point of view, yes, I think that's something that does need to be looked at. Here we are within a stone's throw of Parliament. It's interesting to think that over the years there's been comparatively little uh, official interest uh, in UFOs from MPs. Having said that, there was the famous uh, 1979 debate in the House of Lords and there have over the years been several parliamentary questions raised both in the Lords and in the Commons but uh, quite what it would take to propel the subject higher up the political agenda I, I don't know perhaps just the very sort of uh, clear and unambiguous footage uh, that we've been discussing today I don't know uh, one can only hope that this sort of thing will uh, take the subject uh, you know out of out of the fringe and into the spotlight. For Anthony's brother-in-law Tony, the events of recent years has had a similar sizeable impact. First time I saw something unusual with my brother-in-law was about three years ago. It was uh, late at night, it must have been about nine, ten o'clock. We decided to look out at the night sky and for it's nice and clear. Uh, we didn't have binoculars at that time, uh, so we were just looking out uh, casually and then to the right hand side we saw a white object travelling very very low, not, not, not really fast, just gliding across the sky, completely silent, very bright and that caught our attention and from there it went from there. The first time I was with my brother-in-law um, when he began to videotape uh, these objects uh, was about two months after he moved into the house, uh, he acquired a camcorder, uh, we had an interest in the subject um, so we went out, must have been about 7.30 at night. Uh, it was a very clear sky and one of the first well, one of the first major sightings we had was what we called a blink off. Come it come over through the southerly direction. It was quite large, must have been about approximately uh a thousand, two thousand feet up. Uh bright white object, very silent, uh almost to me it felt almost a bit oppressive how how large it was. 
uh, and just drifted over our heads not too fast and went over to the roof and that was our, our first major sighting that is uh, very exciting to see it. Sometimes my brother-in-law didn't always have a camcorder handy uh, and during these times we witnessed uh, some very uh, important sightings we feel. The first one was in September of 1999. It was about 10.30 at night. We just had a cigarette, just finished the chat. Uh, went out to the front door. And the, first, it's, the first thing that we noticed was the, the blackness of the sky. It was very intense. Uh, and we noticed that. And then I looked over, over the road. And, and above the roof there was four spheres. Four round spheres together. Uh, and that was the first thing that caught our attention. And one of them grew very large. Almost like it's almost like it was exploding itself. Went very large. These are all night sightings, of course. But eventually, we turned to daytime sightings. And one of our major first ones was on the 6th of January 2001. It was a very sunny day. We went up onto Portsdown Hill with a camcorder and binoculars. Uh, we were looking out out to the coast, and suddenly, in our view, three spheres came into view. Very close knit, very close together, moving quite slowly. Across, across our view. Tony aimed a camcorder on it, I aimed a binoculars onto it. I've got a very clear view of it. They seem to be very intelligent and in control. Uh, they are bright white. Uh, they moved across quite slowly and in, into the distance. We could see them right in the distance. They eventually stopped. This, this one was our first major sighting in the daytime. We felt we should change from the nighttime to the daytime. And they seem to be in a tight formation. Very tight together. Uh, very controlled uh, and intelligent. I've been very privileged to see many amazing sightings but one of the most recent sightings was on the 13th of June. Uh, it was approximately 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, very clear sky. I, uh, I've been spotting perhaps for a couple of hours or so and out of the corner of my eye near, near the oak tree, approximately about a thousand feet up, I see a, a, quite a large sphere to my eyes. Uh, I never saw it arrive, it was just there, and it was quite shocking to see that brightness against the blue. I raised my binoculars to the object, and the object, to my eyes, I got it so clear, it looked like approximately five spheres together, it's almost crystal-like, and they were enveloped in uh, a transparent film. It's almost like I could see through them, but I couldn't. It was dead still for approximately five minutes, barely any movement at all. And then. It started to speed up very, very slowly. My brother-in-law was there filming. Uh, it moved very slowly off, and I was getting a very good sighting of it, even with my eyes. I didn't need to put binoculars on it all the time. And suddenly, it did a U-turn. It was amazing to see that. It wasn't jolty. It just done a very careful U-turn, and it started to pick up speed. By this time, I could get the binoculars onto it. Uh, I aimed the binoculars onto it, and it was such an amazing sighting. That, that, the spheres seemed to be quite large, I would say approximately about five feet each sphere. Uh, it started to pick up speed and travel off and I managed to keep it into the binoculars until it got right onto the horizon and it disappeared. But it is an amazing sighting, definite to me it seemed intelligently controlled and was self-aware. I'm sure there are people out there who have a, a sceptical approach to these objects but from my point of view, I, I can assure you that these definitely are not ordinary mundane objects. I've been uh, observing these objects for the past three years, and they truly are amazing, amazing objects. And it, it, very pri I've been very privileged to uh, witness these objects. Uh, I believe the scepticism aimed towards these objects, like people may say, well, they're balloons or planes, simply doesn't stand up. After all, the experience of observing these objects, the intelligent control, the unusual form of these objects is a truly amazing experience. Between them, Anthony Woods and his brother-in-law Tony have borne witness to one of the most astonishing series of concentrated UFO overflights seen in modern times. They are both ordinary people, but people who have been privy to some fairly extraordinary events.
right.
I don't know what this means or where it's going. All I know it has happened, and I've had the experiences since I was a child. Um, I've been lucky enough to film all these sightings. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's something real. It's something unexplainable. It's not mundane in nature. Um, I'm just looking for answers like everyone else. Um, it's been positive for me. I, I deeply feel there is something um, significant behind it all, but what I don't know. But it's a journey, and I just want to carry on until I find out the truth. This is definitely real. It's been a year now since we started work with Anthony on this particular project, and uh, no doubt people like myself are, are going to be quite intrigued and I'd like to think almost amazed by some of the footage that uh, Anthony has managed to, to record. We've tested the footage ourselves, we've, we've been to experts who are far more qualified than us um, to pass credible positive remarks on, on, on certain sequences of this footage. But um, I've been in this game for quite a long time now and 
I've seen mistaken identity footage many, many times. I've seen things that I'm sure has been known to the actual videographer that, that, that it wasn't really anything exciting. Um, people have tried to dupe me over the years and, and, and not just me. That's fine. There are certain people out there that are one or two people that seem to be gifted with the, the knack of being in the right place at the right time. And I feel Anthony and his brother-in-law Tony are two of those such people. You know, if you, if you take a look at, in a bright blue, clear blue sky and, and strain your eyes as far as you can see, you're going to have to be very, very lucky to see something that's unusual. But Anthony's been doing this now for such a long time that, that his eyesight is accustomed, or appears to be accustomed to spotting these things at miles and miles and miles away. The time that uh, my colleague Tony Barker and I were, were with Anthony and, and Tony um, filming for, for this particular project, The Journey, um, we were amazed. We were just shooting out in the back garden and getting a few shots of, of Anthony and his brother-in-law you know, uh, for, for inserts into, into the documentary where, when out of the blue literally Anthony just said here's one and her eyes were peeled really way way out into the distance and what seemed to be an extremely high altitude uh, compared to what, what else we could see in the sky this solitary sphere came across the skies um, I managed to film it for a few seconds and then turn around to try and get the, the shots of, of Anthony and his brother-in-law um, filming the same object, which they did. Um, then I had the time to sort out and, uh, and reframe the camera and get the thing back in shot again. Not very easy when you've got the camera on your shoulder, you're looking into this bright, beautiful blue sky, um, eyes are straining, as I say, Anthony's accustomed to doing this. But finally, when, when I got the thing back in shot, the thing that intrigued me was that when I first recorded that image, it appeared to be thousands and thousands of feet in the air. I'm sure you can agree with me that the thing seems to be somewhere in the regions of air traffic, in other words, 35, 40,000 feet way up there. By the time it had travelled the distance in just a few seconds to be over Anthony's home, then this thing was just a few hundred feet up in the sky. Now, if the sceptics are going to tell me then all I've filmed is, is a balloon, then it's a darn good balloon because this one's coming down. You know, in most instances you'd expect a, a balloon that's lighter than air to rise uh, on the wind and, and travel just blown, blown in a, a single direction. Well, this thing came down and, and lost altitude at a hell of a rate of knots and, and impressed me. Something else that um, caught my eye during the filming of this particular project was, um, again on a visit to Anthony's home, my colleague Tony was taking photographs, still photographs, for, for reference. And uh, we were back at the hotel one particular Saturday night, getting ready just to go and have a bite to eat, and Tony shouts to me, you better come and have a look at this. And uh, on the back of the camera we were just viewing the, the digital images and sure enough, um, this particular day, it wasn't a good filming day. We'd done most of the stuff inside the house. We just kept popping out into the backyard to get a breath of air and things like that. And Tony had taken some photographs of the trees. We, we were intrigued with the red object, which, you know, <laughs> wow, that is one piece of unusual UFO footage. And, and we were just getting photographs of the trees that were in shot of that film. For reference. Now, here's the photograph. Take a look for yourself. Could it be something mundane? I don't know. But the shape of the object is concurrent with the sort of things that uh, Anthony and, and Tony have seen and been filming for, for several years now. And there it was, based to be coming out of the clouds, posing for the cameras. But everything we see has never been threatening. You know, these things seem to gently pass through the sky um, they seem to be ignorant of the fact that people are watching them we've done our research we, we've had people checking newspapers uh, television reports down there on the dates in question when Anthony's filmed this the amazing thing about all this is nobody else seems to be seeing these things 
Now Anthony's definitely filmed things at close quarters, but people haven't reported this. Could it be that, that, that Anthony and his brother-in-law Tony have been gifted with the opportunity to view these things? Whatever they are, they're real, they're solid objects, because they can't be figments of people's imagination, he's recorded them. And he's given his permission for people to see this, and for this material to be disseminated and shared around the UFO community in the right manner. You know, this isn't over yet. We've, we've shown you footage from Anthony from 1999 to this summer. This documentary is still in production in September. We're putting the final touches to it now. Do you know what? Anthony's still filming strange objects. Just take a look at this. Collection of objects in the sky. Filmed not only by Anthony, but by his wife as well. Two separate cameras. Not pointing it in the sun, am I? We feel that this needs further investigation. There are some very interesting, unusual and strange clips on these videotapes. And I believe we've all been privileged to share what Anthony's filmed over these last few years. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you can see the, the reality behind all this and uh, help us take this subject another step forward because we can no longer accept video evidence of Venus or Mars or a distant aircraft as possible UFO material. We need good, clear images. Please, Anthony Woods has shown it's possible to record good, clear images. This stuff's out there, and for now, they are UFOs. At a time when radio and optical astronomers continue their hunt for evidence of intelligent extraterrestrial life, and while probes continue to be launched to distant worlds in our local neighbourhood of space, is it not arrogant of man to believe that he, and he alone, possesses the curiosity and the means to seek out life elsewhere in the cosmos? Might not other intelligent species harbour the same ideals and have already begun to take a closer look at us? Are these aerial craft evidence of that? An advanced reconnoitre prior to first contact? Or are they, as sceptics would contend, some form of advanced man-made craft deploying some new kind of exotic propulsion system? If they are man-made, then some of the footage retains its uniqueness because nothing like it has ever been seen or filmed before. Time will tell. But how ironic it would be if those engaged in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence were to discover that the answers to all that they sought had been staring them in the face for over half a century. The truth is coming. And the first bearers of that truth, it would appear, have started to arrive.